Good afternoon. It's Thursday, the 2nd of March, 2017, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Brian Gerrish. With me in studio, Mike Robinson. Well, the sun is shining here in Plymouth. Blue sky. We've got reports of good weather across uh, UK and north of the border, apparently a mild spring day. So they say. Um, I think we'll just start off by saying well done to Vanessa, because uh, the sun certainly was not shining on her talk last night as it was invaded by uh, a group of... Uh, protesters shall we call them throwing stink aggressive. Bombs, aggressive pretty nasty yeah. stuff well done to the audience for supporting her uh, i think uh, she did a pretty good job by all accounts uh well we've we've got some very good comments in the chat box mike and uh, this is it isn't it this is what it takes for people to be able to stand up in the uk today and tell the truth give evidence you've got to fight a mob absolutely mm. Right, uh, let's get started then um, with this one. Uh, this is Sky News, Sky Views. It's a, an opinion piece on the Sky News website by uh, Sam, Sam Kiley, who's their foreign affairs editor. He's saying that uh, you've been told a deadly lie about IS. He's saying the Western world is being suffocated by a gigantic lie, a falsehood far worse than the fantasy that Brexit will bring, sorry, will make Britain rich, or that Mexico will pay to wall itself off from Donald Trump. It is a lie that, that has and continues to kill uh, and one endorsed by every shade of the political rainbow. It is a porky that even bitter enemies share. The fantastic fib is that Islamic State is a terror threat to the West. He says it isn't. Uh, not even the murderous nastiness of the Belgian bombings, the Bataclan massacre, the Nice atrocities, not the mass casualty attacks that have been headed off in Britain or even the doomsday fantasies of the so-called Islamic State's best brains are strategic problems, and our leaders know this. Pretending that Islamic State is a strategic threat is a lie. One can only hope that the West leaders don't believe their own nonsense. And here's the crunch, because there's something nasty in Vladimir Putin's woodshed. So we don't need to worry about uh, Islamic State, Brian, because it's only Vlad that we've got to be concerned about. Yeah, really incredible um, article, Mike. Um, Sky has pushed this out. Uh, it's from a major writer in Sky. And so the line is um, all of the things that we've been told, including by Sky about ISIS, were false. So will Sky News now be investigating the fact that they've been f fed false and fake news? Uh, and in fact, have been pushing it out. And have been pushing it out. So they've been part of the overall propaganda machine pushing out the fake news. Now they calmly say none of this was true. Um, but what they're really doing is saying, don't worry about ISIS because we need to move on to the next brutal threat, which is apparently Russia. Absolutely. And uh, well, pretty good timing because today the uh, House of Commons Foreign Affairs Committee has pushed out this report the United Kingdom's relations with Russia. It's been quite interesting to look at the uh, mainstream coverage of this report. Uh, the Russian press seems to be taking quite a positive line on it. Uh, the British press uh, being very negative about it. We must, uh, we must maintain sanctions against, Ru against Russia and so on. Um, but uh, this report saying basically engagement with Russia is essential. Um, Let's have a look at some of the conclusions. They say that the evidence that we've received on human... There, there is some criticism of Russia, it has to be said. It, some of it's pretty nasty, but we'll get through this. Uh, the evidence that we've received on human rights is confirmed by international groups who are concerned about attacks on civil society and disrespect for the rule of law and human rights is not only uh, in Russia itself, but in Crimea. The committee shares these concerns. Um, so they, they begin their conclusions by complaining about Russia's approach to civil society infrastructure. And of course, um, as we've been discussing for quite some time, it's this civil society infrastructure which is attempting to undermine the Russian state as they are in Britain. In fact, um, the report goes on to say that Russian foreign policy aims to undermine the current world order, uh, prevent self-determination and independent decisions by neighboring countries, uh, which it sees as regime change and to promote Russia's worldview as a, as a legitimate alternative to Western values. The hypocrisy in this uh, spectacular, as would be expected, um, they say that today the UK must not accept or recognise the illegal Russian occupation and annexation of Crimea. Uh, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office should continue to work with the EU, Canada and USA on supporting Ukraine. Uh, 
here's uh, <laughs> this one may put a smile on my face. A twenty million pound good governance fund, because Britain, only country in the world that knows about good governance, Brian, and we've got a fund uh, good governance everywhere. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. I am smiling. I know we've got the document on screen yeah. at the moment, but we are smiling. Yeah. So the yeah. £20 million Good Governance Fund seems woefully inadequate to address, address the task in hand in, jo in Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Bosnia and Herz Herzegovina, right? Yeah. So uh, we are going to pump, they're calling for more money to be pumped into good governance in those countries. So that's great. Ukraine alone would justify investment of British resources of hundreds of millions of pounds to improve governance. Uh, if that were to secure the central objective of supporting Ukraine as an independent country with a liberal European outlook, it has to have a liberal European outlook. That means do as you're told right? when, when the Europeans tell you what to do yes. and what to think. Right. But then they go on to say that Russia and the United Kingdom have a shared interest in combating Islamist terrorism. Sky says we don't. But anyway, that's another thing. Uh, and extremism. It's difficult to envisage how to progress this shared interest considering the differences between our two countries' perspective definitions and analysis of terrorism. Uh, in, other word, in other words, of course, it's difficult for us to, for us in Russia to, to meet, our government and the Russian government to meet, in, in minds at least, whenever we're funding terrorists and they're not. Is that what that's saying? Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> OK, uh, the government and its agencies should be having a regular dialogue with their Russian counterparts uh, about the causes of Islamist extremist violence and the potential strategies to address it. The shared objective could be utilised to open constructive dialogue with Russia in the areas of common shared security and anti-terrorism. That dialogue should be used to improve relations, better understand Russian foreign policy and initiate discussion on freedom of expression, the rule of law and human rights and the ongoing issues of Crimea and Eastern Ukraine. I'm, I'm wincing at this point, Mike, because all that's in my mind is the state of this country. What is the state of Britain today? Well, from the potholes in the road to the fact that our military is not working, the NHS is not working, the police are not working, the courts are not working, virtually nothing is working, not as a result of failures by ordinary people. This is a result of deliberate and crass mismanagement by the government. Same government now is lecturing countries overseas on how to run their own countries. You can't make it up. No. Uh, and they go on to say that the UK government should reconsider the decrease in the grants to the British Council for its work in Russia, uh, given the valuable work that the British Council does. Didn't the British Council get thrown out of Russia? I think elements did. Yes. Um, well, because British, we've got to fund it more because otherwise, how can we subvert a sovereign nation state yep. unless we, uh, unless get, in we there. Get, get in there? Yeah. Uh, and the other thing that they said was that uh, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office must look beyond President Putin and develop a long term strategy to engage with the Russian people and to articulate a credible positive vision of the relationship that the UK would like to develop with Russia, in particular the Foreign and Commonwealth Office should resource more fellowships and exchanges between British and Re Russian academic institutions, as well as organisations for young professionals to promote the development of shared values and mutual understanding between uh, Russian people, British and Russian people. I think what that means is to promote the common purpose, Brian. Yeah, youth is, is um, a key targeting area. You try and get in amongst young people early and mould the way they think Common Purpose did that with massive programmes in schools, some of it very young children, 11 to 14 year olds, and they were pushing in the pro-European uh, propaganda. We've got a little section later on in today's news where we're just going to be reminding people about what the European youth movement was doing in Britain to try and uh, con the nation into joining the uh, EU as opposed to a common market. But this is the tactic, get in and reframe the views and values of young people. Very dangerous stuff. Yes, but if you do that in a foreign nation, is that not called subversion? It's called subversion, an act of war, in fact. But of course, we've had BBC's own charity, the BBC Media Action, boasting that it was working on the ground uh, with, uh, with people to unseat Assad. So that was a, an act of war on Syria carried out by BBC's own political charity. Uh, an act of war, but, but that, I mean, that can't be right because Crispin, Crispin Blunt, who chairs the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, said that the UK is not Russia's enemy. 
Uh, well, that's a surprise to me at the moment because I would have said it was, Mike. Yes. Well, uh, I, I think we can also say to overseas viewers, you should not believe a word that the British government says. And uh, if you're not interested in deeper political matters, perhaps you'd just consider that the British government steals people's children at the moment at the drop of a hat and then denies it. Mm. Now, um, of course, we like promoting terrorism and terrorists and people affiliated with terrorists, and we like giving them awards. Uh, White Helmet's got the Oscars, as we know. Well, last night was the uh, Television Journalism Awards 2017 at the Royal Television Society. Um, and, uh, well, who got uh, some awards? Well, let's have a look. Uh, Wad Al-Khatib, uh, Camera Operator of the Year Award, and she also got Young Talent of the Year Award. And, of course, this was the young lady that was uh, uh, sending Channel 4 so much video footage, some of it uh, pretty harrowing, um, and Channel 4 were, were promoting that pretty hard. Uh, but she has won two awards at the Television Awards. Uh, and, uh, well, we've just got to remember, sorry. I've just picked up there, Mike, that in the lower one, Young Talent of the Year, of course, one of the, the nominees was Victoria Derbyshire programme. This will be the same Victoria Derbyshire that was doing her best, to, you know, to help blur uh, people asking questions about children Absolutely. in UK. Absolutely. But uh, Ms Al-Khatib's husband, of course, uh, here he is on the right hand side with the glasses, uh, and he is uh, hugging uh, Mr. Abu Bar, um, who on the left hand picture is quite happy to be seen with the group of terrorists who cut the head off the young Palestinian boy. Yeah. So but it, but th these are not, you know, th this is incredible. We are we are continuing to give awards to people that are affiliated at the very least with Al Qaeda. Uh, which is one of the groups that we have said for, or not us, but the government has said for uh, 20 years, uh, is the enemy. Yeah. It's incredible. And who else got an award? Well, of course, Channel 4 News, uh, because we know that they are particularly credible on the issue of Aleppo. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, it was for their uh, Inside Aleppo series that they uh, got this news coverage international award. Um, so that's great. We are absolutely promoting and supporting terrorism through the awards that we give. I've just got to ask Mike on that slide, if we may, the yeah. nominees there are, are interesting because now we've got nomin nom summit, nom nominees, Battle for Mosul and Terror in Europe. So those were two uh, documentaries. And they nominated Channel 4? No, no, those were the, were they, those, they were uh, the that nominees. That was it, right, yes. okay. Yeah. Right. Yes, so that's, so that's really it. Um, we are yeah. keen to support this kind of activity. Well, of course, we're funding it, it's, so, so it's only reasonable that we should. It's all getting a little bit confusing, <laughs> but we'll carry on through the uh, madness that is uh, political news in UK. Um, let's bring in this one. So the Express, um, not in the newspaper for some reason. Uh, this only appears uh, on their web-based news, but it says veterans demand Brexit for defence. Report says EU army ambitions could undermine uh, NATO. So this is quite interesting. Where's this all come from? Well, it's come from this organisation, Veterans for Britain. And we're going to say this is really interesting that they are following the UK column lead. Well, they're talking about a document in the paper itself. We'll come on to that. And here it is. Nouvelle Vague, an audit of EU defence union plans. I find this a very interesting document, Mike, because... Um, why we're we suddenly into defence with a sort of um, uh, high quality artwork. A very strange title, which I'll mention more in a minute. But the, uh, if you go to um, the website, Veterans of Britain, you can't actually get hold of this document. So they've got it into the Express, not in the printed page, but they've got it on the website. You would have thought that uh, they would have been saying to everybody, have a look at this document. But no, at the moment, we can't seem to get hold of a copy. So we're working on that. Um, but why are we interested? Well, because, of course, uh, here we are at the end of, uh, well, beginning of March and Veterans for Britain have just got this information out. Uh, but UK column with all of the good work of David Ellis from Strategic Defence Initiatives, uh, we were pushing this out way back in January. We were warning about what was coming. It does seem to me, Mike, that uh, Veterans for Britain has picked up on the reports that we've actually been pushing out. 
And just to come back to this strange thing about the cover, uh, when I went looking for what this Nouvelle Vague um, is, uh, well, it's, it's a cover band uh, with a variety of sort of new wave music. So I find it rather strange that this should be the cover. Um, somebody passing a message? I don't know. Don't know. Don't know. Uh, well, okay, let's have a look at some of the details. So here we've got, um, the first thing we're going to pick up is a slight spin uh, because the headline is stating that the EU could control the British military beyond Brexit. But the fact is that it is controlling Britain's military and uh, it's getting more and more dangerous. This is comment by Major General Julian Thompson in the article. He says Germany's Defence Minister Ursula von Leyen uh, as recently as September 2016 has said it's time to move forward to a European Defence Union, which is basically a Schengen of defence. And it goes on. It also confirms that the EU bureaucracy has been and is still determined to drive on taking over sovereign responsibilities as it tries to move to ever closer union. And this is a key point we're making that the EU has already hoovered up sovereignty from UK and until we uh, bring this to the public's attention, we can't deal with it. Here's another comment. These dangers include interference with the way our armed forces are administered, the impact on the UK's defence industry and strategic resources, and the fact that such EU defence union plans leave a hook into decisions on sovereign UK defence priorities being made by the EU. So this is uh, pretty clear stuff, Mike, that somebody at last has started to look into the issues that we're being raised, that we have been raised, have been raising. Uh, but of course, there's no mention of the nuclear deterrent in this article, which I think is significant. Well, if we just stick with veterans for Britain, um, this was part of a tweet they put out. Think Juncker's 2017 defence plans don't apply to departing UK, our article might surprise you. So they're definitely on the ball. And if people are saying, well, is this true? Uh, there are There is report after report warning about what Germany is doing in particular. You've covered this in quite a lot of detail, Mike. Uh, this was another article, German army continues to swallow its neighbors. Uh, and in this particular article, some very good graphics uh, showing in this case how um, uh, how the Dutch are being simply sucked, subsumed. sucked into, yeah. subsumed into the German army uh, so that their own control structures are disappearing. So it's quite remarkable, if we want to be a little bit brutal about this, when Germany unleashed the attack on uh, Russia, they did it, of course, not only with Russian forces, but Romanian forces. They had Dutch forces included, and it almost seems to be a repeat so this is part of the uh, quote here. Uh, FAZ wrote, uh, this policy means Germany strengthens its own military power. And secondly, it creates a practical road. I think that should be mapped for the goal of European armed forces. And then the revolutionary handover of sovereignty from the Netherlands is already being seen as a proof of concept that other nations can follow, providing the closest and most varied example of how far the military cooperation between two NATO states can go. Uh, except that's not quite correct because the proof of concept uh, was Britain and France. Indeed. Yes. So um, I think we ought to bring that up on screen because, of course, it was the UK column that was warning back in 2008 exactly what was going on. Treason conducted behind closed doors with the assistance of the Franco-British Council. They were putting together the plan to lock Britain into this 50-year agreement with the French. Theresa May, Theresa May, as many people now call her, is talking about Brexit. There is no Brexit in military terms, as Britain is simply being locked into France, ultimately Germany. And in the text under the photo there of uh, Theresa May, uh, we've got an excerpt from a recently released uh, document, The Future Nuclear Deterrent. 2016 update to Parliament and in this highlighted in red it says very clearly that of course the uh, uh, British nuclear deterrent is now being locked into the French deterrent uh, with joint facilities and it says those are going to be fully operational 
in 2018. So we've left uh, the EU, Brexit apparently, Mike, uh, but what is Parliament boasting that we're going to have the next step of locking in Britain's not just armed forces, but the nuclear deterrent, and, and that is heading towards a 2018 deadline? It is incredible that we can be uh, negotiating, breaking everything apart at the same time that uh, we're locking everything together. It's, it's well, it's only the public that are told anything's being broken apart. Behind the scenes, uh, life is carrying on as normal. And I think we ought to give credit here to Guido Fawkes. He's uh, posted this. Uh, a tweet came out. Um, he says it's accurate. Major and Cameron lunched yesterday. So they had a little quiet tete-a-tete uh, -tete in a pretty high-class restaurant. Uh, this is some of the comments underneath. Two men equally despised by left and right. And one of them says, tra uh, one of the other comments says traitors. But of course, the very dirty political um, agendas for both of these men. If you have not read this book, The EU, A Corporatist Racket, uh, written by Dave Barmby, you need to read it because in here is the evidence of how similar uh, lunch and breakfast meetings were used to put together the whole scam of the European Union. So um, a really great piece of work by Dave Barmby. You need to have a look. And just to emphasize the point here, this is one of the documents which he highlighted. This is um, a document from the European movement, the youth department, as it says. Read the words on screen. Uh, this is all going back to sort of 1993, 90, correction, 1973-74. Uh, so this is the lead up to going into the um, EU, because that's what it was. It says students to support, finance, encourage, visit, bully and expand our 63 branches to monitor, oppose, impede, thwart and publicise policy. NUS, this is all part of the European policy. And this was deceiving the British public because this was being done with letters, for example, as though it had come from ordinary people. It's very uh, Julian Middleton language, isn't it? Oh, uh, very. So this is about subversion. And this was carried out, of course, with the help of people in the British government. Here's some of the names at the bottom. But of course, we've got Ted Heath. Uh, we've got Mr. Jeremy Thorpe. Uh, many names here we can recognise. And I find it interesting that if people uh, are saying, well, is there any truth about Ted Heath and the paedophilia? Um, that's the point of blackmail for driving this country into the European Union. So do have a look at that book by Dave Bombay and reflect as to what you're seeing happen now. And I would say from the utter lies which are coming out from the Conservative government over Brexit. Mm. Indeed. OK, um, events then. Uh, once again, Gilad Atzman going to Glasgow, March the 30th. Uh, get along to that if you possibly can. Tickets are available on Eventbrite. Um, and... Uh, we should remind everybody about Nottingham. We should. Nottingham tickets are selling. So if you haven't got your tickets, um, you need to do that. This is going to be a really wonderful event. And as we, we're saying here, we've booked a vast space because so many people said at conferences, we meet up with other people, but we never have the chance to really talk to them and to get to know one another, find out what people are doing. So this is a big space. It'll take 950 people and uh, the aim is to get people meeting each other, talking, swapping ideas. And organised. And organising themselves. No, no structure, uh, little groups doing what you think is right. And of course, following that event on the 20, uh, 19th to the 22nd of May, Ian Crane has got his AV8 at a very, very smart location. Visit his website, alternativeview.co.uk, and you can have a look at the details for that. Uh, I will be one of the speakers talking at that event. Um, Ian says there's just 40 tickets left. So if you want one of those, I suggest you get online today. OK, now yesterday, um, the media show on BBC Radio 4, uh, Andrea Catherwood uh, presenting that. Uh, and she was speaking to the major players over in the continuing battle over state regulation of the press. Uh, and before we get into what was said on that program, I just want to remind ourselves who is involved in this. Uh, because obviously post-Levison, uh, there were two 
regulator organization set up. Uh, one, IPSO, uh, the Independent Press Standards Organization, that was established and set up by, the, uh, by many of the, pre the mainstream press themselves. Um, a number of the sort of big names like The Guardian, The FT and The Independent didn't get involved with this, but the rest did. Um, and they are attempt attempting to press forward uh, with this organization. Now, um, the press says that it's independent, but the uh, <clears throat> Common Purpose Inspired folks at the Media Standards Trust say that it's not independent, that it's too linked to the press, uh, and they say that it doesn't comply with the spirit of Levison. So that is IPSO. And the other organization is Impress. Now, Impress, small organization in terms of the numbers of uh, media outlets that it organizes, which is basically not very many, none. Uh, it uh, has a few local uh, newspapers, but not too many. Uh, this was the organization set up through the Media Standards Trust, financed to a large degree by Max Mosley. Uh, it is recognized under the Royal Charter, uh, and uh, it was established, the Royal Charter was established, obviously, um, by the government post Levison. Um, as I say, it regulates almost no one. The Media Standards Trust wants everyone regulated by its creation, uh, and uh, the press says that recognition by the press regulation panel and the Royal Charter uh, is too close to state control, so they don't want to get involved with this organization. However, uh, there's still um, a lot of trouble over this situation. It hasn't really moved forward. Lots of people complaining about it, particularly being driven by the hacked off campaign. Uh, and as we have established several years ago, uh, therefore it's links back to common purpose. Um, now, if you want to find out a bit more about the background to this and the links to Common Purpose, get onto the UK Column website. We have a series uh, of articles on this called uh, Levison Inquiry Exposed. Um, now, what was interesting about the run-up to the Levison Inquiry, of course, because who was right at the centre of the complaints of against the press, it was the Murdoch Press in particular, uh, and The Sun, The News of the World, uh, The Times, uh, and naughty behaviour uh, by the Murdoch Press. This continues. Because on Ipsos board uh, was Trevor is Trevor Kavanagh, who works for The Sun, uh, and he basically published an article criticizing somebody that had made a complaint to Ipso about previous Sun journalism while he's on the board of Ipso. And Ipso have quite rightly recognized that this was a conflict of interest. It was completely inappropriate. They've sanctioned him for that, but they refuse to fire him. And of course, there is, this has just generated a whole bunch more angst uh, and, and pressure uh, against Ipso. However, uh, what we mentioned last week uh, was that the Culture, Media and Sports Committee had been meeting on this issue and they, did, they had said that uh, the press basically had one year to sort this problem out or they would invoke uh, Section 40 of the Crime and Courts Act. And as we've said before, Section 40 of the Crime and Courts Act is the piece of legislation it is in legislation at the moment, but it has not been invoked as yet. It's kind of being held over the press like a big stick. Uh, and what that uh, Section 40 says is that if the press are brought to court on a libel charge or a, pro or a privacy charge, um, that whether they win or lose the court case, they will have to pay the costs, the full costs of the court case. That's being held over the heads of the press. And what the Culture, Media and Sport Committee was saying uh, was that the press had a year to sort out the issue of IPSO and, and recognition under the Royal Charter and all this stuff, or they would basically uh, invoke Section 40 of the Crime and Courts Act. Now, what, has, what I said uh, a week or so ago was that the chairman of the committee, Damien Collins, had given a hint that, in fact, um, IPSO would not have to uh, obtain recognition under the Royal Charter, which is the main stalling point for acceptance of IPSO as the regulator. Um, and, uh, and I, but it wasn't really clear. Well, actually, on the media show uh, yesterday on, on BBC Radio 4, he did make it clear. He said that basically they would be offering IPSO a sort of alternative route to, to recognition by the government, uh, which didn't involve recognition by the press regulation panel and the Royal Charter. And therefore, and that the only thing that they really needed to do, there are a few issues, but the only thing that they really needed to do was to set up uh, a method of arbitration for dealing with disputes on privacy and uh, libel issues. 
Um, so it looks like that might be moving forward. If it's moving in the direction it seems to be moving, that's going to upset the Media Standards Trust, the hacked off campaign and uh, common, all the common purpose people that were sort of behind that, Sir David Bell and Julia Middle and so on. Uh, but uh, it looks like it looks like on the surface to be reasonably positive news. OK, um, could we say that is partly because of the good work that the UK column did over exposing the role of common purpose around the Leveson inquiry, which certainly woke up the Daily Mail journalists yes. and they therefore started to see some of the threat coming. But we can probably also add for our viewers and listeners today that UK column has uh, extremely good information that, of course, the the next step is that uh, very, very powerful law firms are uh, on the prowl to close down any embarrassing reports of those rich enough or powerful enough to actually pay their vast um, legal bills. Mm. So uh, we can see that um, information is being taken down from Google. Um, is that information in the public interest, the proper public interest? Do we all need to see it? Yes, it is. Uh, but what we've got is these very powerful law firms, many of whom are in bed with the likes of organisations such as Common Purpose are now taking down. So we're rewriting history to protect the, uh, the wealthy powerful. Indeed. Uh, OK, well, why do we need a free press? I'm going to say thank you very much to the gentleman who said, I think you need to know this. And uh, he was pointing at um, freedom of information request um, around the trial of Joe Cox. No, so, the trial of the person accused of murdering Joe Cox. Yes, indeed. Yes. Sorry there. Um, OK, so man jailed for terrorist murder of MP. Uh, BBC was recapping here back in 2016. Uh, but of course, this was a major event uh, which told us that terrorism was rife in, in UK. Well, what is so interesting about this? Well, have a look at this because through what do they no. know .com, um, freedom of information requests were made uh, because an individual discovered that uh, the jury were not actually using uh, real photographs. So they were making a verdict on uh, computer generated images. Uh, so let sorry, me just. Can I just sorry, Mike. understand what you're saying here? You're saying that the verdict at the trial was not shown the images of the event, that they were given computer generated images of the event instead? Yes. How is that a fair trial? Well, let's make sure we're presenting our viewers and listeners with the evidence. So let's uh, uh, see what we can do to enhance the document. Here we are. And um, what we're really interested in is, is the two answers here. Um, so the person who put in the Freedom of Information Act absolutely had to badger and badger and badger to get this information. And then finally, it came down to two questions. As reported by various uh, media outlets, I want you to confirm if CGI photos were presented as evidence in the Joe Cox murder trial. A simple yes or no will do. You know the answer, so none of the guff I've had before from you, please. Now, this person is a bit agitated because they've been treated appallingly, but look at the answer, yes. So yes, CGI photos were presented. And then it goes on for the second part. If CGI evidence was used, then there must be real photos that can be released. Uh, it is not unreasonable that the CPS uh, will have these, or at the very least will know where they are. What does the Crown Prosecution say? The Crown Prosecution Service does not hold the quote, real photographs. So how did they bring a case then? Well, they brought a case with images where presumably there was no provenance for those images. Now, I believe, I understand that uh, the reason that they used or the excuse they gave for using these computer generated images uh, was that the scene of the murder was so graphic, the jury couldn't possibly uh, want to see it. So the suggestion is that the CGI images were at least in some way um, a watering down of the actual crime scene itself. From a criminal justice point of view, that it's is just untenable, un Mike. absolutely untenable. Untenable. So um, we, we would like to ask for some assistance here that we've shown you a genuine CPS document. You can go and find this on whatdotheyknow.com yourselves. 
Um, this is a question for every MP. Have we now got to the point where we're running serious terrorist murder trials on the fact that we're not presenting uh, proper, credible, provenanced evidence in front of the jury? So this, this means that anybody at any point could be brought to court on a charge um, and uh, have computer generated images of a scene presented as evidence as if it were real could be better than that Mike because you won't be called to court you'll be brought into court on a video link which may or may work and you'll be trying to counter images that unbeknown to you are computer generated images they're not real images this this is for the UK to lecture Russia or China or Syria on governance in their countries this is outrageous but I think that this evidence gives us an opportunity to really hold Amber Rudd in particular to account uh, because she is responsible for this absolute travesty of justice. Should there be a retrial? There should, absolutely should be a retrial. This is not, this is not by any definition a, a fair trial. No. So there we are. We've, we've given our viewers and listeners today that evidence and we say I think it's up to the public now to take this one on and really start digging as to what took place around the murder of Joe Cox and the subsequent trial. Okay, the police then, uh, her, the Inspectorate of Constabulary has raised what they're describing a red flag, apparently potentially perilous state is how they describe the police in England. Um, and uh, well, that's how the media were presenting it at least. So let's have a look and see what they actually said. Uh, they said that this year's wide-ranging inspection found that most, most forces provide a largely good service in keeping people safe and preventing crime, and many forces are to be commended for materially improving the service they provide for vulnerable people. However, the police service is not well equipped to stop crime happening in the first place, as it has been in the past. Uh, in particular, HMIC was concerned to find an unacceptable level of the public being put at risk as a minority of forces artificially suppress demand by downgrading emergency calls in order to justify a slower response, failing to respond to vulnerable victims and not formally classifying gangs of, uh, of violent and dangerous criminals. Uh, they said that two of the 43 forces are outstanding at uh, crime prevention and four are outstanding at the way they tackle serious and organized crime. Only one force, Durham Constabulary, was found to be outstanding overall, and an additional 28 forces being judged as good. One force was found to be inadequate overall, and that was Bedfordshire Police, sorry. Uh, and they said that there are three main areas of concern highlighted by the inspection. They said that some forces' attempts to manage or suppress demand are putting people at risk. So basically, this is where people have phoned on an emergency number. Uh, it's not classified it as an emergency because maybe everybody's already deployed so they've got to downgrade somebody in order to make their their statistical targets they've got to downgrade somebody's emergency call to not an emergency call and that is putting people at risk they say that in some cases police officers are not carrying out sufficiently well their principal activities of preventing crime keep, keeping people safe and catching criminals they say that police capabilities are needed now and will continue to be needed in the future such as skilled investigators and neighbourhood policing, um, and these are being eroded. Now, Brandon Lewis, our favourite uh, uh, Minister for Policing, said the government has protected police funding through 2015 spending review. There can be no excuse for any force that fails to deliver on its obligations. That's great, Brandon. Well done. Uh, well, the NPCC doesn't quite agree, uh, because what they said over the last five years, police budgets... Uh, were reduced by 22% and we lost 32,334 officers and a staff at a time when crime is changing, becoming more costly and complex to investigate and other calls for a service have increased. Uh, it's a simple reality that we're not required to prioritise, uh, sorry, that we're required to prioritise more. There are no easy answers. We have to find long-term solutions and so on. And of course, what's their answer? This is the, the National Police Chiefs Council. Uh, their answer is to ask for money through the transformation fund because the way to deal with this problem isn't to put more police on the streets or, and frontline jobs, more neighbourhood policing. No, no, we've got to transform the police further. And that's what this is all about at the end of the day. Now, uh, what were they saying as they were discussing this in the various uh, news media this morning? Basically, 
this, they're saying that demand for policing is changing. And what's the cause of this? Because they're having to deal with much more uh, mental health issues. Um, so what sort of struck me, Brian, was that this seems to be a fallout from the underfunding of the, or the complete demolition of the National Health Service. We're not providing proper social care. And for, care in the community. If you talk mental, Ill, Ill, um, mental illness or mental problems, might care in the community absolutely pushed people out of, of where they could get uh, treatment and care uh, and made them exposed and vulnerable in the community. Now, I live in the sea, on the seafront in Plymouth here, and last night, for example, there was uh, an old lady with dementia went missing, and they had police right along the, uh, the seafront. Uh, they had helicopters in the air. Uh, these were guys taken away from other police duties because that lady hadn't been cared for or something had yeah. happened. She'd, got it, she'd, she'd uh, walked away and, and had, they'd lost track of her. So... This is going on all the time. Right, but I'll just respond to that, Mike. Um, old lady missing, the police are doing something. That's excellent. Isn't it amazing, though, that we, we haven't got police helicopters and police everywhere looking for the 345 Syrian children that have gone missing, that everybody just says, well, it's a shame they went missing. We don't know where they are, but nobody's looking for them. Uh, so I think there's, there's a bit of... Um, well, there's some questions to ask the police there on that subject as well. Absolutely. But if we bring this one in, which was published yesterday in the Plymouth Herald, but just by coincidence, the timing is spectacular. This is a lady called Laura Beale, uh, and she's decided to resign from uh, Devon and Cornwall Police, and her, she made her resignation letter public. It became an open letter. She published it on Facebook. Uh, and what she said gives us a clue. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase it here slightly. We're going to take some sections out of it. What she said gives us a clue to what's going on. She said, I am Police Constable Laura Beale on response covering Mid-Devon. And I'm writing this to inform you that as of this date, uh, I am resigning my post as Police, con uh, police Constable. Uh, as a result of the way I've been treated within the organisation, I have to undergo cognitive behavioural therapy. So I now suffer from anxiety depression and stress. I would rather take the massive pay cut and quit uh, than spend one day longer in a job that is making me ill. I have seen police officers who are completely incompetent get promoted because it's been too difficult for higher management to manage them. So promoting them and moving them is the easy option. I've also seen incredible super supervisors in their roles be moved because of a, because a space needed filling. Staff are not coping. They're suffering because there's no one looking out for them. Frontline response is where you need to focus your time and money. This is where the, bulk, the, the, the buck stops. We are always called upon when things need doing and when things go wrong in every department. And that's really the, uh, the main outcome of the Inspector of Constabulary report is that not enough time and money is being put into frontline policing. But here was the key quote from this lady. I thought, we are more like a business now in how we function in relation to finance and customer relations, uh, yet we're so far behind on employee rights. But this is exactly it, Brian, uh, the commercialization, the corporatization of the police, uh, and we're seeing the outcome of that. Yeah, and, and I was fascinated to see that. We're more like a business now because the other day when I was trying to find out a number for another police force, I phoned 101. It's answered by Devon and Cornwall Police and uh, the, the, they informed me that the call was being monitored um, for training and, quote, business purposes, unquote. Uh, and I said to the lady who answered, that's unusual. And she said, well, we have to say that now. But that's it. Training and business purposes. Um, so where can we go now? Well, let's bring in this one back to the Plymouth Herald. Police face 20 million budget black hole after losing legal battle over supermarket giant store. So what's the story about? Well, Devon and Cornwall Police ex at Exeter decided they're going to sell off property to a supermarket. Uh, the deal went wrong and now they're left with uh, a black hole. So let's have a look at it and then we can ask some questions. So retailer Morrison's signed an agreement to build a new store on land at police headquarters at Middlemore and Exeter. Police earmarked 20 million of proceeds from the deal to build a new police station and custody suite. Uh, however, Morrison's never started building work on the plan store, triggering a legal battle. Uh, the plans received the green light in 2014 for a big supermarket petrol station, 83 homes, and a new criminal justice centre 
uh, also known as a custody facility for the police. So my question is, how were the police able to sell public land? When did the police become a business and subsume that public land to be able to sell it? Uh, it this, sounds like fraud to me, Mike. This is a good question. And of course, this uh, comes back to my re request from the Treasury to understand how much of this public land is being sold off because we are seeing this massive sell off of national assets. And the Treasury don't didn't, know. didn't know. Too difficult. They haven't got it on the database. Well, very quickly, let's end on this. Um, again, sent in to us, and I found this very, very interesting. So somebody's pushing for a Freedom of Information request against Kent County Council to know about Freemasons in the organisation. And there is response, delay, obfuscation, bluster, twisting. However, um, what emerges are some names of Freemasons within the organisation. Why am I putting this up on the screen? Uh, because if these men and women had been members of common purpose, they wouldn't have been required to declare their interests in the first place. So we've got a pernicious political charity, Princess Anne there being uh, uh, pushed on the front page of Common Purpose. They can hide their membership, uh, but others have to declare their membership. Why should that be? I'll leave our audience to answer the question. And then if we put it into context, here's Amber Rudd. So she's the lady uh, now responsible for um, justice where you don't have to have real evidence. And she is bigging up uh, the appointment of Cressida Dick as the head of Met Police. But of course, Cressida Dick is a common purpose guru, is extraordinaire. We have no idea what meetings Cressida Dick has had with common purpose graduates or will have or is having. That is totally secret from the public. Uh, same common purpose that's worked to control the media. Yes. Nothing dangerous in it then. Well, we'll end there. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much to the people who've recently made donations to us. Much appreciated. We'll just say, as always, if you're not a subscriber of UK Column yet, please take out a subscription because that makes a huge difference to how we run and we would like to expand our news coverage. I think there's a very pressing need for more UK Column, more other people that want to take on the lies and fake news of British mass media. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back same time tomorrow. Correction, Mike will be back same time tomorrow with David Scott. With David Scott. Thank you. Bye-bye.